Okay, <laughs> welcome back. Um, I just refilled my coffee, so I should be good to go for a little bit more. Um, just wanted to answer more questions. This is part three, and we are going to be focusing on um, grading assessment feedback, um, your alignment K through high school, and then um, some other questions that came up, okay? All right, so here we go. So grading, assessment, and feedback. Um, this is a whole nother presentation, like no joke. Um, I am hoping to present on this soon um, because I think this is a really important piece to the puzzle. Um, so I'll be honest with you, here's, here's my philosophy. First of all, I don't like grades. Um, I think grades are punitive. I think they don't really assess um, our students in the best manner. I feel like our students are so focused on getting a grade and not on the actual learning process um, that, they're, that their focus becomes on that percentage or that letter grade. Especially at my school is very high achieving. Every little percentage point, every little point counts because that um, does their you know, GPA and they're all like, have like 4.6s is ridiculous, right? So, um, not literally, they don't all, it's a very diverse population, but there's a lot of that. Um, and so I just, that's another piece to this puzzle for me. And, and <laughs> um, someday I'd love to open up my own school and like restructure everything and change the world. But until then I'm working within that boundary of our school system. So here's what I say. Um, assessment is what I look for and I tell my students this. So this last year, so in the fall, um, last summer actually, I devised this like no grades policy um, for my jewelry medals, all levels, for my sculpture. Um, and this year I'm going to be implementing that also with AP. Um, I didn't do it with photography and I'll explain that. So my no grades policy really truly isn't a no grades. Um, students still have to get their grades. They still have to have percentage points, whatever. Um, a lot of questions came up about like, how do you grade? Can you talk more about that? I have to still put points into my grade book. I do too. Um, so I've been really playing around with how to, um, work the system. <laughs> um, so a big piece of this is that our school has been talking about for probably like as long as I've been there, so maybe longer, maybe 10 years, um, about going standard, standards-based grading. Um, and uh, we even had like pilot groups of that and then our other school in our district decided not to. And so like, you know, it's just a lot of different back and forth. Um, so nothing has really been set forth. But what I noticed is that I was talking a lot at presentations about my students are so authentically engaged in their learning process, they don't care about grades. Um, and so like every toolbox, every little thing, I was putting in points, I was putting in everything. Um, and then what I noticed was like students who maybe did, would do the toolboxes, but um, maybe didn't turn in everything or maybe whatever they were like punitively scored even though every single day they were engaging in class and learning and growing and creating and I was like why am I taking points away <laughs> like why is this system here in the first place like there's they're learning and I can give them feedback and what I noticed is that my most important piece to this was assessment and feedback I no longer say grades. So I say call it a no grades policy. Um, I piloted it last year and it was a huge success. So I wanted to put my money where my mouth is and say, if my students are authentically learning in my classroom, I can't really truly present or talk about this if there are grades involved at all. Um, because that's still there and students could still be very driven by that. And maybe it's just not as... Um, explicit to me in the classroom. I don't know. So I wanted to take them away. So last year, I last summer, I devised this whole policy. I pitched it to my administration. Um, I think I probably could have just done it and they probably would have like not even maybe noticed it. I don't know, but I wanted to make sure that I was kind of covering my basis and so that um, if questions came up, they weren't like thrown off guard because then at that point, I probably would have gotten into trouble. So I talked to my administration about this and I said, here's my problem with grading. 
here's what I want it to look like. Here's what I believe true learning looks like. Um, and true learning happens when I'm able to assess and provide feedback and have that feedback loop continually occur. When that happens, then students continue to learn and want to learn because I do truly believe that students are um, children, teens, whoever, people in life. I do believe that human beings are authentically and intrinsically interested in learning. Um, I think that's just part of our human nature. And I feel like our system has set them up to think that the way that they are being taught is the way or assessed is the way that we should learn. And that's just, I don't agree with. So, um, and I, and well, I would say this too, and also like in education, you see a lot of shifting happening, right? Towards inquiry based and design thinking and STEAM and STEM and all that kind of stuff. So obviously, um, other people are thinking this too, right? So I pitched this to my, um, admin and they said, well, you still have to have something in grades in, in grade book. And I said, okay. Um, and, and we have summative and formative percentages and that's how it's broken up. And my one administrator said, well, I'm going to challenge you to think that, um, cause I was saying, well, formative is more important in my class than summative. And what I mean by that is formative is all the like daily ins and outs and summative is their artwork. Um, and I want the formative to be weighted more and I want them to know that I value that 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 process is driving that product and that they should be able to take a risk on their summative and not have it fail them right punitively and he said well I will challenge you to think about how you think of formative and summative so maybe truly your summative is all that learning instead of it being just a project or just an artwork or whatever, like just a single focus. Instead, maybe your summative truly is all your daily ins and outs of learning, like because you're, you're focused on growth. I said, okay, I buy that, but I'm not, still not on board with how, I can't wrap my head around what that looks like. And I really geek out about assessment, I will tell you. So that's why I want to do a whole nother presentation or six about those. <laughs> so, um, and this is always an ongoing process, so I don't have all the answers for you now. But, um, Currently, what I do is I focus on the studio habits of mind. I um, changed my grade book instead of points. They are valued as marks. Formative is 0%. Um, and summative is still worth like 100% or whatever. I can't remember how I divided it, but because um, I'm going to be changing it this year based on our situation. Um, but in the formative, um, Instead of having points for each assignment, I gave like a standards-based rating, right? So meets, exceeds, that kind of thing. And the thing is, is that students would get those marks as whether they were exceeding, meeting, proficient, or needs improvement. Um, but they didn't count for anything and they didn't mean anything, but it was giving them feedback. So that's one way I give feedback is through my grade book. Um, and then in the comments section of my grade book, I will write a little note, you know, needs improvement, focus on your 2D composition or refine more or wow, you really went above and beyond, you know. And then in the comments, what I often use are my studio habits of mind. Like um, I saw you really per engage and persist on this. It shows through your craftsmanship or whatever it is, right? So I'm, again, <laughs> reinforcing all of the language I use in the class goes into my grade book as well and goes into my feedback. At one point, I tried to just do it all, like make my marks based on the studio habits of mine, but I don't think that gave them really any feedback. It just pointed out where they were focused on. So I'd rather use that in my comments and then have my um, marks show them kind of where they're at and where they might need some more support. I think that's really helpful later too when they get into the artwork because you can say, well, look, you know, before you start to do this artwork, I'm looking at your marks in gradebook and I see that you exceed in craftsmanship and exceed in all these areas, whatever it is, but you consistently are kind of below in your composition. So what I would suggest is that you really practice your composition a couple times more 
um, before you get into your artwork. And that could be in a low risk way too. You could just do a bunch of sketches, do more sketches, do more thumbnails, um, use tracing paper, move that around. So you're really reinforcing that skill that they need to keep on practicing and show them how those pieces connect into their creation. Um, so that's one way I give feedback and I set up my grade book. They ultimately do have grades, right? So their summative um, is actually, I think what I did last semester is I set up their summative still as their artwork and I gave them feedback on their artwork and students can always redo artwork. They can always redo something for more points or for more practice or whatever they want. Um, but I think I said in my webinar, we talked about the growth piece and they set up those Google Slides from day one. So they're really focused on showing that along the way and that's what they submit to me at the end of each challenge. So there might be a template for the Google Slides that shows all these different pieces to it like um, uh, challenge one might be, you know, like I said, wire forming or something. And then in each of that shows like it has a slide that's maybe planning and research, you know, describe your creative process. Another slide might be, you know, taking your photos. Remember you asked about how you get good photos. Take a, you know, this is a 3D piece. So you have to show it from a couple different um, ways. I have them write their artist's name. I have them write their, the title of their artwork, the medium and the size. Um, just like an artist would, right? I want them to get into that practice of treating their work as artwork, right? Um, and then they build each unit or like toolbox onto that. So by the end, they're already building that entire um, portfolio. And then I can give them feedback along the way. So at the so let's say they turn in this forming slide link to me that says I'm finished with my forming. They turn in their artwork so I can physically look at it and see it and assess it, um, put it on display, right? Um, and then I look at their slides and I give them feedback on their slides, like, please give me a little bit more information here, or have you thought about this? That feedback in those, the comments on those slides, then they can either totally disregard it <laughs> or they can apply it to their next slides. And then when they get done, their growth, they should be looking at all those comments. They can go back and adjust. So that's not, again, their final grade, right? So their final exam grade is that final portfolio that they've hopefully adjusted and tweaked and refined as well. Um, so that is the grade that they end up getting. So along the way, um, the first, so we have a couple, every month we have a progress grade that we have to submit, a grade um, into gradebook to post for parents to see where they're at, even though they can access their gradebooks all the time anyway. But um, so in the first one, and I have this a whole sheet on my grades policy, I'm happy to share that as well. I do share that with the parents first day. Uh, I email all the parents. I talk to the students about grading throughout the semester, kind of don't do it all at once because it's a lot of information and they don't really connect it because they haven't even taken the course yet. Um, but I do email home all the, to the parents. Um, it cracks me up. I had a student say, like, I said, what did your parents think? And one student's like, my mom wanted to know if you're a hippie. And I was like, hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, but I basically um, have gotten so much good feedback from parents on this policy. Um, a lot of them are like, thank you. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to my student to be able to create and feel good about and confident about their skills. Thank you for, I totally agree with you on the educational, uh, you know, pressure of grades. So it's been really great, but sorry, going back to the progress. So the first progress report grade, I say, um, pass or fail. That's it. They're all passing. <laughs> There's no failure unless a student literally is doing zero in my class, right? They all are passing. And then, um, which I have had a student do zero in my class, but that kid had other stuff that was going on clearly. And so that's a whole nother topic, right? But, um, but most of them are just fine and happy as can be. So they get a passing. And then the second month, I give them a passing or failure, but I give them an on track grade. Um, and so I give them that passing, but in class, I give them a slip of paper that um, says, this is your on track grade. This is why. These are things that you are doing great. These are things you can work on. And they have that feedback. Then the third 
progress report, they get a grade posted in Gradebook. And that's there, again, I make it clear, this is your on-track grade, meaning like this is where you've come and this is where you're at for the end of the semester. And then at the end of the semester, they get that last final grade. Um, so along the way, still feedback, still grades, but I'm putting, um, it's just a lot less pressure on like, I have to do math and figure out points and they get 20 points and they completion points and you know I should give them a C for this like it's even in a rubric it says this but it's just the rubric should indicate in my opinion students need for feedback to give them improvement and stuff so it shouldn't be punitive um, they are learning right in my point like why are we being so punitive when kids are trying to learn that is just instilling fear for them to learn. So I, that's my policy. Hopefully that made sense. I'd be happy to show you um, kind of that link that as well. Um, how do you give personalized feedback quickly to students verbally? Um, to students, question mark, verbally? Um, yes, yeah, so I talked about this a little bit in the last um, video, but I definitely give them um, immediate feedback verbally on track feedback, you know, um, in the grades postings, I give them feedback in my, um, grade book. I will give them feedback written on their slides when they send that into me, um, submit that into me. I will, um, sometimes talk to them and ask them questions and see what they're thinking. So yes, I give them a lot of feedback. That is what it is based on for me is assessing them, not grading them. I'm assessing them and I give them feedback. Um, I often will engage students to talk to each other. So if a student comes up to me and says, um, hey, Mrs. Taylor, I don't know what to do for this. I might, there might be like a couple kids waiting to talk to me, right? That sometimes happens. They like line up to talk to me and I'm like, I feel like a celebrity, right? And I'm like, I don't know why you're lining up, but why don't you come over here? And this student is asking about this. Can you give them feedback? And so we will have a discussion together and that helps me. I will model some of those questions like, oh, I'm curious about this or I'm thinking about that. Instead of saying, you should do this or you should do that. It's like, I'm curious, why did you do this? What choice did you make this? this way. Um, and then I'm instilling that kind of environment in my classroom so that students are always asking those questions of each other and they um, come to me a lot less. It's kind of weird at the towards the end of the semester I feel like I, there's no purpose for me. Um, I'm just kind of like standing there watching. I don't even need to give feedback. You know it's kind of kind of weird. Um, can you explain this assessment process more or offer more resources? So yes I will give you guys my um, no grades policy again Please don't take it as like, this is the way to go. Um, I had to figure this out. I'm still changing up how I do it. Um, it's kind of vague. Uh, I explained it more thoroughly just a few minutes ago, but um, you are welcome to have those. I just, um, a couple months ago, I got the book by Katie White called Unlocking, Unlocked or Unlocking. Um, I'll have to look at that. Um, I am, it's like the key to assessment or something like that. Um, I heard her talk at, on the Grendler's um, podcast and it was everything. I was like, yes, yes, this is exactly how I feel. This is exactly what I do. Um, and so I was really excited. I ordered her book and then COVID happened. And I have not had a chance to really, I, I read like the first maybe couple pages or first chapter or something. And I was just like, yes, this is exactly how I feel. And hers is talking about assessment, I think, creative assessment across the board, not just art, right? Um, so I would highly suggest maybe checking that out. I can't, I don't want to say like do it because I haven't finished reading it myself, but so far it looks pretty good. Um, how uh, do you give feedback? Is it a quick comment in the classroom or do you use rubrics, write them individually? Personally, I find giving feedback takes a lot of time and I have 150 students. It can be daunting. Yes, I agree. That's why I think in the classroom, when we're in the classroom, it's really best to just give the immediate feedback so students can, um, can just fix it in the moment or talk about it or think about it, I guess, not fix it, but think about it in the moment. Um, I agree that writing feedback gives a long time, hence why I'm doing these videos for you guys, because I think it takes a long time to write stuff. Um, I think it takes a long time for me to talk, but I hope you prefer me talking away instead of reading my <laughs> comments. Um, but um, yes, so 
it's usually a quick comment. If students want more feedback, they will ask for it. Um, or if I see a student needs more feedback, like they are just not getting it, I will pull them and do like an intervention. That's also the great thing about choice is that kids are always working at their different paces. Um, so you can, kids watch what each other's are, what each other are doing. Um, so they will be inspired. They will ask questions. They will kind of learn just even by watching other students. But um, as far as giving feedback, I can like pull small groups to reteach something or I can do a hand over hand kind of demo. Now, you're going to be like, well, but it's COVID. What are you going to do? So I'll talk about that in the next video. Okay. Um, but that's typically, I can answer that because that's how I teach, right? Um, I do use rubrics. I use rubrics for every challenge, um, not for like the technique practice. I just do it for the challenge. Um, I usually just circle things on there and then I might give it back. Um, and I give that quick feedback in Canvas. So it's not like long, extensive um, students. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, he's an English teacher and he basically is like, if you want feedback, you can make an appointment with me and I will give you time. Um, and so I kind of put the onus on them too, a little bit like that, right? If they want to get better, that's part of learning is learning how to ask for help too. Um, how do you formulate grades for work? For grade per book purposes, we are expected to enter grades. Same here. Um, hopefully I explain that. Um, but Prior to doing no grades, I will tell you, I did do my toolbox were worth like very little um, and they were all worth that formative percentage. So I had a ton of points in gradebook. Like my gradebook was crazy, um, like five points, five points, three points, five points, you know, like just everything that they did I was putting in and that also took some time to kind of go through. So um, you know, it's up to you what, what works for you, but that does work. If you want to put all those points, they all add up. And then I'll, I would do like technique stuff would be, I'll be like five to 10 points. And then their challenges might be worth like 20 to 50 points, depending on how I felt that they were, um, on that scale. So like if it was a small challenge versus something more extensive, you know, it might be even worth a hundred points. Right. And then the summative was always, you know, a hundred points for each artwork. And then I usually give, points also along the way for formative for their slides, you know? So all of that stuff adds up for sure. Also, will you clue me in more on grading growth? I see great value in the approach, but would love to see more info or a model. Um, okay, so grading for growth. So I do, I would say this, my grading for growth, my students are always growing. There really is no like, um, well, you didn't grow enough. And so therefore you don't get, you know, points. It really is like integrated in how I'm asking them to demonstrate growth. And I think that's the key is for them to be thoughtful and reflective as to their um, their own growth, right? Like, look at how far you came. You walked in here. Have you ever done jewelry before? No. You know, have you ever, like, sure, you photograph. Like, let's look through your, your role, like, prior to this class. Like, these are not great, but look at all these. They're super great, you know? Um, so being able to identify those pieces and not just at the end, but all along the way. So every time I do a slides in their reflection piece, they have an artist statement for their challenges or for their artwork, right? They have an artist statement which is different than a reflection. And in their reflection, I make sure to focus on growth. And I say, what have you learned from this that you plan on taking into the next or you would like to use later on? So, wow, I really learned actually how to make a focal point using emphasis. Like you can see that in this artwork that I did, you know, and then I would like to make sure that I use that in my next piece because for my next piece, I'm thinking about doing this. And I will tell you that even if the students don't know what their next toolbox is about or they don't know where they're really going next with anything, they usually can start, they start envisioning artworks once they start kind of going in that. They're like, you know what, this is cool. I really want to use this next time. Um, and this is what I'm thinking. So that's kind of that. And then at the end of the course, um, the slides or whatever, it, when I, when they have their final, right, they not, not only have to uh, submit a final portfolio, but at the end of the portfolio during their final exam period, which is usually 90 minutes, um, I have them clean 
the classroom um, or the studio. I have them clean the studio because that's important to set it up for the next um, class. But I also have them do a reflection, which is really talking about, um, and they add that into their slides, and the slides are like talking about the course and what are some of the aha moments that you learned? And this could be about life. It could be about, you know, some students are like, I realized that I could take risks and that it was okay. Um, some students are like, you know, I don't want to take jewelry anymore. And I'm like, I hate doing that. You know, whatever it is. They um, Usually it's more like, I realized that I could do something that I never thought I could. Or now I really want to do more jewelry or sculpture or whatever it is, right? Um, so... All of that portfolio plus their end of the course reflection is what I grade. And again, there's a rubric for that. And it's talking about how they're using um, examples. And it's all to support their writing to write claim and evidence. Well, my claim is that I took more risks and I'm excited about that. My evidence is you can see that in X, Y, and Z. As I went through the semester, I started off very nervous and I copied exactly what my neighbor did. And then by the end of the semester, look, I was doing these crazy out of the box ideas, you know? Um, so again, annotating work throughout, teaching them how to annotate, teaching them claim and evidence in their slides, giving that feedback in their slides, that's going to be important too. Um, coming from elementary, structuring grading is more of a challenge for me. Do you have any tips on giving quick and quality feedback to your students all through Canvas, paper rubrics, conversations with takeaway notes? So I think all of those are yes. <laughs> Again, it's not like, you know, when I first started teaching, I was like, this is how I'm going to give feedback. And this is, a, no, now that I've been teaching a while and now you guys have been teaching, right, for a long time, you probably are like, yeah, actually I do this all the time. I think sometimes in our practice, it's good to remind ourselves that we, it, to take some time and go like, how do I teach and how is this helping my students? And yes, I can take this information and I say, I am doing this already. So how can I boost that, right? How can I push that to reinforce what I want out of my classroom? Um, so those would be my big takeaways for the grading and assessment part.